Welcome. I'm Mara Gladstone, Director of Programs and Interpretation at Desert X. I'm speaking to you from Kauia land, and I acknowledge the Kauia people as the original stewards of the land on which Desert X takes place. All of us are grateful to have the opportunity to work with the Indigenous people in this place. We pay our respect to the Kauia people, past, present, and emerging, who have been here since time immemorial. Desert X is a not-for-profit arts organization whose mission has always been ambitious, presenting free biannual exhibitions of site-specific work by international artists who engage with the natural forces that shape deserts, while also responding to the immediacy of this moment. From its beginning, the organization has called on all its audiences to be brave and open their hearts, paying attention not only to their own physicality, but also to the stories that the artworks tell. In this sense, our public programming for Desert X is grounded in the pasts, presents, and futures of both the Coachella Valley and communities around the globe that are shaped by shared circumstances and experiences. Through virtual gatherings, hybrid programs, and educational initiatives, we offer a range of opportunities for connection and conversation. Our next program, Taking Action, features a streaming film and a virtual gathering, which builds upon today's conversation. Please visit our website for more details. I'm thrilled that you can join us today for Fugitive Bodies with Desert X artist Felipe Baeza, co-curator Cesar Garcia Alvarez, and scholar Luisa Laura Heredia. Hi and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation, Fugitive Bodies. I am Luisa Heredia, a professor at Sarah Lawrence College, and I'm going to be in conversation with Cesar Garcia Alvarez, the co-curator of this year's Desert X and the founder and executive and artistic director of The Mistake Room, and Felipe Baeza, one of the participating artists at Desert X this year and whose work, Finding Home in My Own Flesh, along with his broader practices animating this conversation. Now we'll be discussing fugitive bodies more in depth throughout the conversation. So I'll just start by saying two things. So the first thing I wanna do is situate the three of us in relation to one another. In each of our fields, we're navigating institutional spaces that we challenge simply by appearing. And we each have these broader practices or projects that are intended to shape those spaces or to create new openings or alternatives and to find ways of engaging our communities. It's what makes this conversation between an artist, a curator, and a scholar so generative. We are imagining and working towards something more in the collective sense. And it is through that exchange that we also are forming community. The second is situating Felipe's work in this context. The themes raised by his work are critical to us in this moment, as they have been critical in all of the moments before this one. Immigration, criminalization, queerness, the precarity of life, and imagining alternatives and futures. Felipe's work raises for us a system that has rendered so many unequal and with less value. His work, however, centers the individuals and the communities that are navigating this, pushing back, and creating life and livelihoods in the process. So let's begin. The way that I thought we would start out is actually turning it over to each of you to tell us a little bit about how um, this project kind of came together. So Cesar, why don't you give us a little bit of information about you know, your relationship to Felipe and kind of what your hopes and ideas were of having him kind of participate as one of the artists. Thank you, Luisa, and thank you, Felipe. Um, I uh, am one of the co-curators of, of this third iteration of Desert X. Um, and I actually was approached to consider taking on this project um, in late 2019. And at the time, I was sort of working already with Felipe on his first institutional um, solo project that opened at The Mistaken, which is the organization I direct in Los Angeles in early 2020. And in the process of thinking about um, 
some of the artists I wanted to invite to side visits to the Coachella Valley, Felipe was definitely um, sort of at the top of my list for multiple reasons. Um, Felipe's work is grappling with a lot of issues that intersect um, ideas around issues of immigration, I, thinking about the construction of non-conforming bodies, but also more importantly, I think thinking about the idea of a fractured sense of identity, the idea of people who consistently have to navigate their sense of personhood as it's relitigated in many ways through multiple kind of spaces, institutions, and conditions in which our bodies exist and spaces that our bodies inhabit. And Felipe to date has worked largely, you know, within a studio practice, working, trained as a printmaker, working on, you know, works on panel and on paper. But I immediately sort of started to ponder on what a work by Felipe would look like outdoors and in relationship to a multiplicity of audiences. And that's sort of a little bit about how our conversation began for this work. So I didn't necessarily sort of have an idea per se about what, you know, what I envisioned that Felipe may contribute, but rather I was interested in how Felipe's practice would unfold in this kind of exhibition um, that is, is quite different. And I think, and a little, you know, from a more conventional gallery or, or, or museum context. So Felipe, what was the site visit like for you? Um, what was kind of the origin of what we now know is the mural? Um, and what kind of prompted you to say yes? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously having had a relationship with Cesar and have been working with him and uh, previously in, in a project, you know, showing out the mistake room, um, he threw this idea of like maybe the possibility of just of thinking of showing at Desert X, right? And what that meant uh, for me. Um, and I think I came at this project, you know, uh, with already sort of a knowledge of, of having visited the Coachella Valley multiple times uh, before this came to my attention. Um, but also thinking of a project that seemed very, uh, uh, in many ways, just seemed very true to my practice, right? I didn't want to come in there as, as in many ways, just making a project and a spectacle. <laughs> uh, but in regards, I wanted, you know, I wanted the project to be very much interested into my practice, but also into the locality. And, and through various conversations with close friends and with you, Lisa, and also Cesar bringing this to my attention, I came to find about uh, El Destino, which was a, uh, which was a bar that was located in India, you know, and as the, the, the name of the bar uh, literally translates to basically uh, to destiny, to destination, to, to purpose. Uh, and just as the name describes it, it was a destination uh, for a lot of queer people of color. Right. It, it was a, a, in many ways, a, a magical place that became a portal uh, for those individuals. And, uh, and it was a place in an environment uh, that in many ways had to be made physical because the landscape wasn't there for it. Um, and sadly, it's no longer there. Um, but that is very much the origin of this, this project of the power of reinventing yourself uh, and creating uh, liberatory structures for self-emancipation. And so the um, other kind of then thing to kind of talk about is what frames the discussion, right? Fugitive bodies. So I've seen kind of your practice grow kind of over time and uh, the ways in which you have centered kind of this bodily form, right? This kind of fugitive body. So um, tell us, you know, what is the fugitive body and how have you been kind of engaging with it and excavating it through your practice? Yeah, my practice um, has led me to conceptualize what I call fugitive bodies, racialized, queer, and otherly able persons uh, whose exist existence transgress multiple limitations of identity. Uh, my art practice then centers um, a different lens where I'm both the, the, the participant, but also the observer of these stories and themes of these fugitive bodies. And when I when we think about the fugitive body is someone who is always on the run, but also someone who's always in concealment, but, but lives without status. Uh, or as Fred Moten would describe it is to live without credit. 
And I'm interested not, not only in my practice, but also with this mural to reconstruct new imaginaries of neither here nor there, allowing uh, for the fugitive body to make use of imagination as a tool for, for liberation to transcend circumstances. Uh, and in that regard, my work is concerned with, with the body as practices and the possibilities of making subjects that contain their own uh, complexities and agency. And I aim to uh, create new meaning by working with, uh, by working together with different creative languages such as collage and printmaking and in doing so telling um, alternative, an alternative history, right? An alternative mode of inhabiting time and space. And my most recent practice, including this mural, investigates how memory, migration, and displacement work to create uh, a state of hybridity and in many ways a fugitive state of, of suspension. And with that being said, you know, I, I aim to render visible those bodies and histories that have been in many ways rendered invisible or erased from the record. And in making and in making invisible visible and vice versa, uh, I aim to challenge the notions that keep people uh, in the margins. And I use this strategy to imagine structures and possibilities for, for the self-emancipation of the hybrid fugitive body that lives in and is persistently uh, susceptible to, to hostile conditions. You know, the possibility of self-emancipation uh, is forged by the necessity to, to survive and thrive and where one is forced to create new forms and new structures which produce liminal spaces of belonging. And that's what I kind of see in many ways in my practice, but also in this mural that this, these true forms, you know, are giving life and are producing life and are thriving in many ways. Um, Sasan, you mentioned a little bit about um, part of what you were hoping for having Felipe kind of come down to the Coachella Valley, right? And kind of thinking about how this would unfold. Um, but you are also understand Felipe's work as something that's kind of very deeply personal to you and particularly this idea of the fugitive body. So now that this is kind of coming to fruition, how, how do you relate to this notion of the fugitive body and, and, and what's going on there? Yeah, I think, you know, when, um, when we started working on Desert X, on this iteration of Desert X, we were in the midst of an incredibly troubling presidential election year. And I think over the past four years in particular, the conversation and the language around um, immigrants, around refugee and asylum seekers was weaponized in many ways by the previous president as an anchoring component of his political strategy for re-election. And I think for a lot of us, or for folks who maybe aren't immigrants themselves, like Felipe or myself, um, the language through which these ideas were disseminated to other communities seemed clinical for me in many ways. It was about policy that encompassed building walls. It was about numbers of people. It was about sort of legal processes for asylum seeking. And it seemed also incredibly disembodied. And I think that for me over the past couple of years, I thought often about not sort of thinking about the immigrant experience through a series of policies and pieces of legislation and convenient political theater, but thinking about how that experience is felt. And when I met Felipe and we started talking a little bit about this sense of a, a fractured sense of identity, the idea of the never ending crossing, I like for me, that sort of is what drew me to Felipe's work because I think that there's something that really centers the body in, in, in Felipe's practice. And it also inevitably speaks about a human story that is quite felt and that I, over the past, you know, 40 years, I felt, you know, was sort of not as embodied as, as some of us feel it. And I say that because I think that the crossings, the immigrant experience does not end the moment you arrive in this country. I 
arrived in this country when I was eight years old and I lived undocumented for a majority of my youth until I was 18. And even though my status has now changed, there are moments where that experience of not necessarily feeling legitimate, not necessarily feeling like a person happened for me in the most subtle of ways. They happened for me when I travel and come back into the country and feel like I still have to perform because there's a possibility I won't be let back in. Or when my family arrived, it was in the midst of the Proposition 187 debate. So my family didn't allow us to spend a lot of time outside because there was this incredible kind of fear that like they would take you. So I never learned how to ride a bike. I never learned how to swim. And those activities for me still trigger a relationship to that act of crossing. And so for me, the migrant experience happens in these incredibly intimate ways on a daily basis that are that shape the way we exist in the world. And I, I think that is sort of a little bit about, you know, what drew me to Felipe's practice was thinking about how we expand the conversation besides the, the kind of policy realm and the legal realm and think about how that experience of migration happens daily. Um, even when maybe seemingly to folks outside of your own experience, it looks as if those things don't affect you anymore, don't impact you anymore. You don't carry that trauma with you anymore. Um, and so I was, you know, when I invited Felipe, I was hoping that this would be an opportunity for us to, to have this project also maybe get us back to a conversation around how this experience is embodied um, and, and, and how these acts of crossing um, happen on a daily basis for us. Um, and so that I think is sort of the context in which I was thinking. So it is a very personal project. I think out of all of the projects in, in, in Desert X, I, I really do think that um, Felipe's project and Eduardo Saravia's projects for me were, were deeply personal. And as a curator, you're always trained sort of to try to find some distance between the work you're doing, um, you know, and, and so as to kind of seek some idea or notion of objectivity. But the real question is, is that I, I've also kind of, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that anymore. And, and it felt like it was important to also be able to perhaps cite myself in some of the work um, that I was going to do within this exhibition. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say, you know, Luisa, sorry to trip, but I think, you know, Sarasa mentioned something quite important that, you know, and we talked about this many times that obviously, you know, I want to be clear that fugitivity is made possible by outside forces, right? <laughs> by the constructs of, of the law. Um, but also, um, there's also a desire and need for someone to be fugitive, to live outside the norm. and and. And that crossing that Cesar has been talking about, you know, in many ways marks you as, as fugitive once, once that crossing happens. And for me, you know, the fugitive for me, you know, is always on the run. You know, it's always in concealment. And as Fred Moulton would put it, it is to live without credit, you know, and I'm, and I'm interested, you know, in this project, but also in my practice to, to reconstruct uh, new imaginaries of neither here nor there, allowing sort of the fugitive body to make uh, use of imagination as a tool for liberation to transcend circumstances. And, and with this mirror itself, but also with my practice, you know, the, the, the body functions as a praxis, right? So I think when we think about the title, Finding Home in My Own Flesh, um, I think that's been constantly how I've been moving through through this land right, and through space, um, and and in with this process, you know, I aim to render uh, visible those those bodies and histories that have either been rendered invisible or that have been either erased or made or made absent um, from the record. And in making the visible, um, in making the invisible visible, and vice versa, you know, I aim to challenge those notions that that keep people uh in the margins and i use this strategy to imagine structures and possibilities uh for self-emancipation of the of the hybrid uh, fugitive body that lives and is persistently uh susceptible to hostile conditions but this is only made possible um 
like the possibility of, of self emancipation is is made possible by the like for, like the necessity to survive, right? And that I'm here because of that, you know, because of my parents, like they're forced to survive, allowed me to be here. Um, but uh, but also within that, you are forced to create new forms and structures uh, that, in many ways, produce uh, liminal spaces of belonging. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, what's kind of interesting about what you're you're both raising, right, is we can understand fugitivity in multiple ways, right? And on the one hand, we understand that fugitivity is something that is made, right? It's made through laws and policies and whatnot, and things that are unbelievably disembodied, right? Clinical, like Cesar was saying, right? But that have real ramifications on the livelihoods kind of of people, right? And then that have those echoes, right? that kind of continue to persist throughout one's life. Um, we can also think through the ways that fugitivity is produced, but also reproduced in the everyday, right? In terms of the institutions that you're navigating, in terms of not being able, for example, to go outside, right? Because of the fear that has been stoked up kind of in the community based on a whole series of criminalizing laws, right? That are meant to make people fearful, right? That are meant to, um, render people into kind of an unequal status kind of in this country. And so we certainly kind of see that part. But then I think the other part, Felipe, kind of that you're raising, right, is also thinking through this notion of fugitivity as the person who says no, right? The person who imagines, the one who turns away from the law, right? The one who says, you know, it's unjust and we need to kind of change those things. So resistance, right? But also like not even like I'm going to situate myself outside of a place because this is a place that does not want me. And so how yeah. do I find and build a life outside of that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, yeah, exactly. I think it's also much of a desire to live outside, uh, outside of a system of control. Right. And, and I think, you know, I always, you know, like question sort of my desires and it's like, what is the fugitive body desire? You know, in general, it just desires freedom, freedom to another kind of life <laughs> to put it simple, but also it desires freedom from the law, freedom from being captured, freedom from, um, uh, freedom from regulation and freedom from punishment. Right. And it's this, this, this complicated duality that, you know, yes, there are outside forces that, that put you in this state of suspension because it is a state of suspension. But but um, there are also I think there's also f something fruitful in the desire to be like, I want to live outside the system. Like, I mean, I am I've been living outside the system. My parents have been living outside the system for 20 plus years. Right. So there is something livable outside the system. And I think I also don't want to risk the risk at like romanticizing that. That I mean, the, the being fugitive is is a is a desperate way of living. The world is not like. <laughs> Um, you know, like I, I think there's also, you know, we run at risk at normalizing such, such state of suspension. They exist in attention, right? On the one hand, you want to be able to kind of recognize the ways that communities, the ways that people kind of have learned to survive and not even just survival, right? Survival, I think, always reminds us of this idea of like bare life, right? And certainly some folks are kind of experiencing that. But these ideas of um, of joy, right? We can think about like Yossi Marreas talking about joy, right? Things are not just tragic, but they're actually funny. And um, we can think about questions of like pleasure, right? And yet, right, they exist in attention because on the other hand, you're, you're not saying, for example, oh, no, 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 this life like is fantastic. It's wonderful. And those laws absolutely don't matter because they, they do, right? They set kind of these different kinds of conditions kind of and foundations for um, people to live, right? And then for them to have to kind of maneuver or navigate around them. Um, I'm also like super interested in uh, the idea of both like the desires, but also kind of this idea of the imagination, right? And being able to kind of imagine when we think about uh, that kind of level of fugitivity, or we think about your work and like the bodies that are being kind of suspended, um, there is kind of this, this, idea of either imagination kind of on the one hand, right? What we imagine for them, how they grow, kind of those kinds of things. Um, but also I think uh, this idea of 
what are kind of the supports? What are the things that are necessary uh, in order to make those lives like fruitful, livable, pleasurable, joyful, um, and and all of those kind of parts of it as well? Um, Seth, I wanted to loop you in here too, just kind of in thinking through that other part of fugitivity, right? Like that turning away from or that um, uh, space of like joy or of, you know, supports and finding these alternatives. Yeah, I, it's, it's interesting because I feel like when you use words like imagination, they often at least in at least in my upbringing, it wasn't necessarily um, a necessity. It was something that was superfluous. It was something that we didn't have time for because when you live on survival mode, we don't have the space or time for beauty or for pleasure or for these things. And so even just in my own practice, which I think, you know, I've been doing this for some time now. I, I, um, I started when I was in my early 20s. I'm in my mid 30s now. Um, it was never something I envisioned being able to do growing up because like many other, like, you know, folks who grew up in immigrant households, you, you know, I had parents who, who expected I go to med school or, or I go to law school or do something productive that that was going to sort of move me up in, 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 you know, in my ability to have the life that they didn't have. Um, it took me a long time to realize how important it was for me personally to think about the imagination as a political kind of project and thinking about the imagination as a skill set that needed to be cultivated and that needed to be mobilized strategically and tactfully and thinking about, you know, and that really happened for me with a relationship, a professional, really interesting kind of professional collaboration that I had with an artist um, who helped me sort of found the space that I run now, who I was at the time working at another institution. And it was sort of the first time that somebody sort of said to me, you may be able to like do this on your own. You have the capacity to sort of be able to support other artists in this way. And it was fascinating that it sort of took took quite a few years for me to get to the place where I said, you know, this is as important or the work is as important as work that, you know, other folks are doing because the ability to imagine yourself in a circumstance that is different than the one you feel conditioned to have may seem like such a poetic, I didn't say like, it, sometimes even to myself when I was younger, I was like, that sounds like such bullshit. But it wasn't to be when you sort of realize that this isn't just sort of unnecessary, that we need to have conversations about being able to use the imagination as a as a mechanism to live and not just to survive. Um, I think that is sort of what anchors in many ways my curatorial practice is about the ability to be able to nurture whether it's artists or audiences through the work I do both at the institution I founded and run and through other projects um, to be able to mobilize this kind of work for that. I think there's something incredibly powerful about thinking about the idea of or thinking about imaginative potential in relationship to a political kind of practice and and I think it also helps you to find your audience very much. So it, it gave me clarity in terms of what I wanted my practice to be, the kinds of artists I wanted to work, how I wanted to structure the work I wanted to do. Um, and so I think for me, that's sort of what it's, it, it's been for art. I always say, you know, to folks for me, it's like that expensive store growing up that my mother said we couldn't go into because it just wasn't for us. And then to be able to sort of allow ourselves to know that that's also for us too, I think is 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 really the most rewarding part of the work, and I think it's it also drives a lot of what I what I do. Um, Felipe, you talk a lot about kind of the queer imaginary, the migrant kind of imaginary, kind of in your work, and it's certainly something that as viewers, right, when we encounter it, 
we're drawn into and we're asked to do, right? To kind of imagine these alternatives kind of and whatnot. I didn't know if you wanted to say kind of more on that um, in relation to uh, what kind of Sasad is raising for us. I, mean, I completely agree, you know, um, that the role of imagination, you know, I mean, now, you know, obviously I see it as such a liberatory tool, right? As an artist, as a person, uh, and as a survival mechanism, you know, but I think also maybe is to uh, Im aligning imagination with with envisioning, right? That I'm here because my parents imagine another world possible, right? Beyond the world they only knew, uh, and I think that's that's what I tied to the migrant imaginary. You know, I think we have spoken about this briefly and thinking that the migrant imaginary is so threatening to nativists in this country, right? That we have other individuals coming into, into this land with other worlds that, that, that they have, you know, other worlds are possibilities. Um, and, you know, and, and in regards to this, uh, like the queer optic, you know, it's, they have offered me uh, a quite an uh, expanse way of working and thinking of, of looking outside of a, uh, outside of, a, of, a, of the only sort of um, view we have, right? So thinking of a very alternative view of, of viewing the world in general uh, in regards to just, you know, in regards to queerness and how in many ways queerness, I attach it to, to my experience of navigating this country as an undocumented person uh, and, and in the sense of like making spaces, right? And finding community and that's that's sort of like the, the 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 way to survive for a lot of us, right? And, and envisioning structures and making the structures physical. Yeah, and it's kind of through those communities, right, that you're then kind of able to kind of to imagine together collectively, right? And then not only that, but then to pro produce or to create the structures, right, that are then going to be those supportive structures. Um, for kind of those livelihoods, right? This idea of like community and kind of really um, the central role of that, I think is also something um, that kind of that you're, you're both raising. So um, when we look at kind of finding a home in my own flesh, right? One of the things that we see, even though we're talking here about fugitive bodies, right? And, and the bodily form and making things embodied, right? One of the things that we, that we see or that we don't see is then the absence of the body, right? We have the two hands kind of, and then the foliage and the vines and the flowers and whatnot. So tell us a little bit about, um, the absence of the body in this piece. Yeah, well, I see this duality. Yes, obviously, there, there might, when you encounter the mural, you might sort of see an absence, but and sort of this, um, this uh, sort of a wound, right? Which I don't see. You know, for me, the the body is there. The body is fully present there and and flourishing and thriving. Um, but but I think in regards to absence, you know, I think about, you know, in regards to my practice and in regards to the way I work materially that I find abstraction in relation to absence as a fruitful, fruitful place to work from, right? That sometimes the body is not fully able to be consumed, right? That once you encounter the work, it, it starts to reveal itself in, in parts, right? That the body is fully there. It's just the time of you spending it, spending time with the work itself. But there's a, such a such a need uh, to be legible, right? And for a lot of us, being legible means <laughs> means the worst, right? And in regards to thinking about, like, yes, visibility is a trap, uh, and you know, we could also talk about you know the right to opacity. Uh, and I think for me in my practice, but also in this mural, you know, I I'm excited to see at this at the scale it's going to be, you know, because it functions very differently in my studio where where sometimes the actual hands kind of blend in with the background. So you don't kind of really see what's happening, but it's the more time you spend with it that it starts to sort of review itself. Uh, and, and in regards to thinking the power sometimes of, of that, uh, of not, be, not being fully legible to someone. Yeah, I mean, when we think about legibility, right, becoming known, one of the things that also kind of comes with that, right, is surveillance, right? And, and you know, making yourself known means that you 
can then also be kind of surveilled in other in other ways. Um, I, I see the piece, you know, and I think it really is so, um, it provides us such a, a, a window into some of like these major things kind of that are happening, right? And so this notion that the body kind of is still there even in its absence. Um, one of the things that for me, it's so haunting about the piece, right? Is that it reminds me of like the multiple absences that we have kind of in our community and really kind of in particular, I think the disappearances kind of in our community, right? The ways in which folks are being kind of disappeared through the detention and the de deportation kind of system, um, the ways in which we've lost folks, right? Uh, in the crossing, right? In kind of uh, attempting to migrate, um, but also I think in this particular moment, really kind of thinking about the losses in our community um, through this pandemic and through kind of COVID-19 and the unbelievable losses, I think, in our community. And so there's a there's a, a hauntingness, right? A reminder, a memorializing too of those who are not kind of here. Um, and the flip side, of course, then is that um there is still something there, right? There is something growing out of these hands. There is something, um, again, really beautiful, really um, full of life, right? That the piece also kind of um, brings for us. How are you thinking about either this particular moment or this idea of um, the absences that we, we kind of see uh, through, again, the laws and kind of policies and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you you point that out. You know, the, the imagery itself is some. It's an imagery that I've been working for the past maybe three years, right? And and it came from a place of trying to memorialize um, those lives that uh, through this sort of middle passage of, of of coming from one place to another didn't make it to the other side, right? And thinking very much that those lives are still thriving, um, and. And for me, for this project, you know, yes, it started at origin in, in regards to trying to memorialize a space that once existed, right? But, and we're also thinking about the land that it exists on, that that land, you know, has had a history. You know, I think as when we think about the desert, we think about this sort of expansive new space, which, you know, like that's just like the settler colonial mentality, you know, that there's a new canvas. Um, um, and in regards, you know, I think, you know, the essence of the project in many ways, yeah, it is coming from this origin um, of, of, of the bar, El Destino, but in many ways it has developed into so many things that we have been going through in the past few years uh, in regards to a lot of absences, right? That, you know, I mean, I feel like this week marks the one year anniversary since all this kind of started in, re in relation to COVID. Um, and just how many lives we've lost, you know, how many histories we've lost, uh, but also how we haven't had time to mourn. And that's something that no one is talking publicly. Like we really haven't mourned and have even, um, how is it to, um, I guess, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is we haven't stopped to, to inner tracks to be like, we have lost so much history, right? So much knowledge has gone. And I think in a way is it, the, the mirror itself is also um, in a way it's beyond memorializing, it's recalling to, to those histories, right? That, that they're still thriving, you know? And I think that's also part of, you know, part of this spe specific project, but also my practice in many ways, in rethinking about those sort of erased histories or those histories that are absent from the record and bring them back as much as we can, you know? Um, without enacting the same violence in regards to those same to the archive, right? That 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 um, um, that got us here, right? I mean, I think I mean we're all we like everyone on this call is here because someone is absent, you know? and I think that's something to think about too. And thinking that there are absences in within our families that we don't know about, and it's enacting those absences and memorializing those absences. Yeah. I think the the interesting thing for me, over the last year, we've been having this conversation about reimagining the idea of a monument, which inevitably is tied to having a broader conversation about who deems who and what is worth remembering. But I think that that logic, and we've seen, you know, from foundations to civic governments, 
put in this push to let's take down and replace. But all of our heroes are our heroes until they're not. And I think that that approach to thinking about memorialization is fraught and failed from the beginning. The word in itself, when you think about a monument, there's an object hood tied to that process. There has to be a marker, a physical thing that functions for us to do that, whether it's a person, you know, whether it's this natural approach to how we think about the monument. And a memorial in many ways, I often think about in its relationship to the ethereal, to a moment, memorializing a particular moment. But even those processes, I think, still think about memory as a static thing, as something that we can hold and contain. And mm-hmm. memory is a process of both remembering and forgetting. It, entail, it is an act. Mm-hmm. It isn't a thing. And so what I think is really powerful about the work that will unveil in April you know, by Felipe is that I think of it much more as an act of remembrance because it cites the viewer in a situation where you can acknowledge that absence with a kind of relationality to yourself. And so whether that person there, you can think about whether it is, you know, immigrant folks who've been left out of, you know, localized histories of labor movements, whether it's queer communities of color, whether it's a mom or a sister or a parent or a grandparent they lost to COVID, there is an exchanger that allows a viewer to cite themselves in that work. So I've been thinking a lot about remembrance as opposed to memorializing because there's something about thinking about it as an act that involves both who is remembering and what they're remembering that I think is a perhaps better way of framing how we should be approaching our understanding of both collective memory and the ways we sustain it, you know, for ourselves and for others who aren't like us. And in the telling, right, the viewer kind of is engaging with that. And this then is the act, right, to remember um, and all of that. But then there's also then the speaking and like the community building, right, and the stories that then get to kind of um, recirculate right, kind of in the community with each of those acts of remembrance. Um, I, I think it's also when we, uh, going back to kind of what you said much earlier, Sasad, right, it's also kind of another way of thinking about the clinicalness, right, of the numbers that we get, right, of the COVID deaths, of the, um, the what was it, the decline in um, the uh, how long we live, right? The ways that impacts kind of particular community or communities of color more than other communities. Um, the numbers of deportations, right? They're given to us in the in the this uh, in in these abstractions, right? Through numbers in ways that don't connect us kind of to those lived experiences, right? And this is something else that that uh, we get to kind of then kind of experience with this particular piece. Um, uh, as well. So, um, well, so let's talk a little bit about kind of the the piece, right? Um, in terms of kind of what that process uh, kind of has been like. Um, Felipe, what, you know, when you said yes, and kind of, you know, now that the piece is kind of going up, like what were, what was the process for you? Like, what were your desires kind of for this particular piece um, and for situating kind of that piece here in the Coachella Valley? Yeah, when I obviously when I mentioned, you know, um, when I got the invitation and just even think about the possibility of this happening, um, the mural, I mean, I guess I could speak first materially, uh, the mural uh, finding home in my own flesh came out about uh, about thinking about ideas um, about how I can incorporate sort of the techniques I use in my practice and in the paintings. Um, in, which is a work that is fragmented, right? And, and collaged as a form that breaks to, to unity. You know, so I thought about working with either materials that somehow mimic that process. And, you know, in, in, in mentioning this to Cesar, you know, he spoke about, about you know, the possibility of making a, a mosaic tile mur- mural. And that, you know, was just sort of like the actual connection, right? That That is also a process of fragmentation, you know, um, that, comes to unity and it has been a process of working you know with with the ceramic asuro in guadalajara um 
and in many ways, not really treated as a as a artist fabricator, but also more of a collaboration, right? That I feel like, obviously, they're doing it because they have those abilities, and I don't, you know. So it's much of a conversation about um, about them sort of putting their touch and, and transferring what I what I am giving them into their own way of making, which has also been fruitful for me uh, to not be dictating the whole entire process, um, and. Obviously, this is a this is a new adventure for me, and it, and it's very much a reflection of how I construct my paintings in my studio. Um, but my desires for the project, you know, I had two desires for the project itself. You know, obviously, yes, you know, a lot of all the installations are public, but I was beyond public. I wanted this mural to live outside the exhibition date, right? Um, to in many ways uh, find. Uh, a home for a while and as much as we can. Um, and my other desire was for this project to be in a location that, in a location in a community that mirrors sort of my similar experience, you know? So when we visited Indio and went to Alistino, obviously that was sort of the origin and that's where I wanted to have the piece. But the actual surface of the wall of, of the establishment didn't, didn't function for the mural. Uh, and then, you know, the second location was Coachella uh, and downtown Coachella. And in many ways, you know, it felt like I was back, you know, to Pilsen is where I grew up in Chicago and just kind of seeing mirrors everywhere and just seeing the importance of, of that visual, uh, uh, just the visual in regards to the murals, um, how important it was me as, as a child, right, to see myself also in those murals. Um, and then, you know, after some, some challenges, the mirror itself has changed locations, right? Um, and now in many ways, it's back to, to a location that I had not imagined. But with that being said, the essence of the project has not changed at all. You know, I think the essence of the project still functions very perf perfectly as Cesar put it. It's, it's, um, right now in the location, it's like smack middle in, in Palm Springs, um, but the actual very much, uh, essence of the project for myself has not changed in any way. So I'm, uh, wanting to kind of, you know, reflect on the process of it, uh, with uh, Cesar, with you as well. Right. And, and slightly, um, giving us kind of some of the process and what's been going on, um, and, and the placement and all of that, but also kind of, um, thinking through a little bit of your own practice. Right. And in particular, thinking through, uh, this idea of, um, what you kind of see your role as, right, when it comes to your role as a curator in a biennial, right, versus your role um, with something that is kind of rooted, an arts-based kind of institutions that is rooted in geography, like the mistake room. Um, how, what, when you came, came to kind of Desert X, how are you kind of thinking through this and how has some of this unfolded with Felipe's piece? That's, that's a really interesting question. Um, for a couple of reasons, because I think it inevitably makes me think about what I do or, or a practice or more so, right? Which, which I think curatorially for me, that's always bothered me. There's, there's some curators who I think um, think of their practices in an artistic way. And I don't necessarily know if that is how I like to characterize my work um, because I don't think that that's the role of curators. Um, but I do think that it operates sort of very differently in terms of what institutional work for me, you know, within a, you know, directing a space and then the idea of organizing a temporary kind of large scale exhibition because, and I think you need both of those, but I do think they play different roles. And I think that they are both codependent uh, with each other and, and, they, and they should be in many ways. Large scale exhibitions all around the world are imperfect by their nature. And when you look at longer histories, you see that, for example, Documenta, which is a big art show, started as a recovery moment for a particular place in Germany in post-war. Prospect New Orleans started as an opportunity to start rebuilding a cultural infrastructure after Katrina you have these large-scale exhibitions that emerge in moments 
out of a particular kind of urgency. But those specific histories, I think, become in many ways often forgotten or difficult to upkeep as time passes and those urgencies they responded to perhaps also shift. The role of the institution is different. You're wedded to a place. And a lot of what you do has to be thinking about a longer term practice that evolves over many years. So when I wear my hat at the institution I work in, I'm thinking about not just what I show or who I show, but I'm thinking about the institutional project overall. I'm thinking about who is working here. I'm thinking about what kind of infrastructure is established. What does my what does leadership look like here, right? Like what does the board of directors look like? How do you engage in all these institutional activities? And all of that synchronizes with the kind of work that, you know, I'm doing with artists. But here I am thinking much more about five years in, 10 years in, and how all of that gets organized sort of is rooted to an institutional project. And the program is so deeply rooted to the responsibility that we have as, as a civic institution to not just the artists that I show, but also the ones I don't, right? Our curators here have to conduct regular studio visits. Our curators here, I feel, have a responsibility to making sure that we continue a kind of dialogue in artist studios in the city. But that is because the project here in many ways is rooted in the place and it's not a, there isn't a sense of being episodic in many ways right but at the same time I also have worked on other biennials for example made in LA where I had to shift and it's very different and there's a different kind of temporality there's a beginning and there's an end and I know coming into it that my engagement has a certain sense of 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 you know it's much more condensed in a way where I have to arrange my expectations and my intentions for what I'm going to do for a very specific moment. And usually what you want to do in that situation is be able to acquaint yourself with the other entities that are locally, local museums and cultural arts centers, local arts writers, who the expectation, I think, you know, public art commissions, elected officials, who really bear a big responsibility to being able to create support and sustain cultural infrastructures that then are accountable to artists. And so you have this bigger sort of exhibition that happens every other year. And Desert X, by the way, is, I think, and at least as I always understood it, is meant to have an international scope and sort of be you know, in dialogue with, I think, a kind of locality, right? And so when I came in here, I had a, a project that was envisioned very much so knowing that it was about putting forth a sort of set of ideas and knowing that there was, an, and it's an opportunity to make, I think, a statement as opposed to how I approach my work at the mistake room where it's a long, that's my life's work. And so I think that, that those those roles are also interesting because in the mistake of my operator as a director and here I'm a curator. So here I also have a certain kind of responsibility to the artists and the projects, but you definitely need both. And what's been, I think, candidly a, 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 an interesting sort of situation is understanding and thinking about who else here is, you know, who is create, who's doing that longer term work. Right. And I think, at every sort of level of this conversation, I think it's been interesting to sort of see what role public art commissions play, what role city, you know, elected officials play, what role independent art centers play, or what role the local museum plays in its relationship to a local scene from both cultivating an artistic scene to creating that support, and then trying to sort of shape an exhibition that can be in conversation with an existing cultural infrastructure. And that is never an easy task, I think, for anybody. And it hasn't been an easy task for us um, and for me personally. And I think that, um, you know, th this comes with the territory. And I also, I think, while this show isn't shaped by a pandemic, it, you know, it isn't necessarily about a pandemic, it's shaped by one. 
And I did envision a different kind of exhibition. And there were very particular limitations around what I could or couldn't do based on, can artists come here? Can we meet in person? Can we organize event-based things or projects without endangering, you know, people? And I think that, you know, it was definitely um, realized in a different way. I'm very proud of the show and I'm very proud that we're able to actually realize it in these conditions. But I also think that it also exacerbated perhaps some of the processes that I hoped I'd be able to engage in, um, you know, by coming into Desert X as a curator and finding a way to work locally. I want to kind of go even just a, a expand on that just a tad bit more, right? Um, and, and actually likely in a bit of a different direction, um, which is, you know, when you're talking about this practice that you have kind of at TMR, right? I'm wondering about your decision to, to do Desert X, right? And um, the kinds of ways that you're maybe linking up some of the TMR work, right? And your work with a particular set of artists um, and uh, kind of what the not the logic, but kind of what you were thinking through in terms of taking on this project and bringing in the folks that you did kind of end up kind of bringing in. I, I think it's twofold. I think on the one hand, there's a personal reason for it. I, I was raised in Mexicali um, and I have family that has long lived in the East Valley. And that is a desert my family traversed coming here. And growing up, it's a desert we frequented to visit family, but it's also a desert that as I got older, I, I didn't necessarily, I had trouble returning to. Mm -hmm. It was a constant reminder of a particular kind of childhood experience that reminded me consistently that like, I was displaced. Um, and for many personal familial reasons. And I wanted to see if my own relationship to this place, which is still very sort of important to my family, I could maybe shift that conversation for myself. So there was a personal reason for taking on this project. And there was also a professional one. And the professional one was that, you know, in previous iterations, every, by every large scale exhibition like this needs to grow and evolve and change and build from what it's done. And hopefully every edition, you know, gets better. And I'm hoping that whoever will do this after I will also will do a better job next. That's, I think that is what we should aspire to, right? But I think that I was interested in an exhibition that comes out of this relationship or idea to land art. That's a particular kind of history that doesn't include folks of color, that does not include queer folks, that thinks about the landscape as a, as a kind of open locale in which to act upon. And I wanted to bring in projects that perhaps shifted the way we even sort of talked about, about this place, right? Um, and projects that perhaps could uh, remind us that this isn't a vacant locale, that it is, you know, that there have been people here living since time immemorial, that there are communities who either by choice or circumstances live here, whether there is a music festival or there isn't. And being able to sort of realize works and bring in artists that often aren't seen in projects like this or whose practices perhaps aren't always imagined as being um, compatible with this project. And also there is a popular dimension to Desert X. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm a recovering academic and I think that, you know, one of the interesting reasons why I didn't want to do that work anymore was because I felt like I was writing for a group of seven people who we were all writing for each other. And curatorial work presented an opportunity for me to be able to do this work in relationship to a public. And so the Desert X audience is expansive, right? And I also wanted to understand what it would mean like to bring projects that had perhaps more in-depth and critical conversations to an audience that was as broad as this. So that is a little bit about what I was thinking. So there was a personal, I think there was a professional, and then I think there was something interesting that I hope would do something for certain practices. 
the reason that so many artists who are in the show are artists that have shown at the mistake room is also a very practical reason uh, because I think this list could have looked in many ways. The situation in which this exhibition eventually ended up getting produced, we were in the midst of, are we shut down? Are we open? Are we going to have to cancel the project? Can we open it? Can we, you know, like, do we have to change the location? There were so many variables that curatorially, I wanted to make sure that I was working with artists that I felt comfortable I could steward through those challenges. Whether it was that a city council felt that one work I proposed wasn't necessarily a statement piece, or whether a incredibly well-intentioned health-providing nonprofit felt like, you know, the politics of Felipe's work weren't amenable to their support base. Um, I needed to be able to navigate and be able to steward an artist through what I already knew was going to be a difficult process to realize this show. And I wouldn't necessarily do that to an artist with whom I'm beginning a relationship with, because I do have a practice that tends to invest in artists in the long run. And I work with artists I multiple times. I think that in many ways does define a little bit of how my practice operates. And so I wanted to make sure that I'd be able to do my job curatorially to both protect those I was working with and stewarding them through what I already knew were going to be a lot of challenges. So, you know, that's, that's sort of how the artist list gets shaped and what I was hoping to be able to do and, and why the exhibition, you know, looks this way. And I will say that, you know, I, I, before this show, I, be, I hadn't collaborated with another curator. Um, and and I, I was like, curatorial collaboration doesn't operate. I've done it before. It wasn't great. But I do have to say that working with Nebel has been an incredibly meaningful and productive sort of moment in my practice. Because even though our, you know, we come from very different backgrounds and have wildly different um, professional interests, the opportunity to have incredible conversations um, and to have a curator like Neville that has, you know, like a lot of sort of experience, be able to also come in and champion my work um, and champion the work of artists that maybe he didn't know yet, but now I'm sure he'll continue to work with. I think that in when you sort of see this, and I think it's important for me to talk about it too, because I had a lot of these questions, or like, well, you know, why would you sort of take on this project or why would you work on this project? And I think for a lot of curators of color, we've always had to fight tooth and nail to get every seat that we've been able to hold. And it seems easy on the outside, but it isn't easy. And so the opportunity of being able to also have an ally like Neville champion ideas that perhaps, you know, were new to the kind of work that he was doing was also really powerful for me to have a platform like this and to be able to then open this platform to artists I work with. And we're never going to fix, I think, issues of inclusion and inequity with one show. I think that is misdirected. I think that there are a multiplicity of things that have to be addressed collectively, right? But I do think that, you know, I'm grateful um, for that collaboration. And I'm really looking forward to being able to working with him with him again. I so appreciate, right, the way that you walked us kind of through uh, the role of kind of a standing uh, geographically specific um, arts institution versus something more like a biennial, right? And here kind of at the tail end, you were hitting this kind of a little more closely, but, you know, part of what you're raising for us, right, which um, those of us who navigate a variety of different institutional spaces are all like, yes, of course, right, um, are the ways in which we actually have to really kind of break ground in these institutions to find space, right? I mean, everything that you're talking about for me reminds me so much of Felipe's fugitive bodies, right? And of needing the imagination, of needing the structures of support, right, to be able to kind of do that. Um, but the other thing that I think is kind of so curious, and here I'm going to kind of loop Felipe back in, right, which is, which is to say, um, you know, Felipe, 
Uh, so Cesar is telling us a little bit about his practice, right? And the kinds of things that he's kind of trying to do kind of and whatnot. Um, but I'm so kind of curious, like for you, right? Because you as an artist, then navigating a particular set of institutional spaces or your own desire to want it to be a mural, right? That was outside, that was kind of longstanding for this particular piece, right? Um, what, uh, tell us a little bit about your own relationship to kind of the, the, some of these institutions and then some of the uh, ways that that kind of is playing out um, in, in the mural uh, here for Desert X. Well, I think just in general, I mean, my whole lively, lively career has been about navigating such spaces, right? And making space for myself, whether I was invited or not, or whether I was allowed because my illegality, um, and that's had, that have in many ways has been sort of my, uh, my experience in navigating these spaces, right? And I think one thing that I should mention, you know, yes, I wanted this project to be a public piece, obviously, but also to live outside ex exhibition day, but to be in a very specific community because I saw the importance of art outside of the institution, outside of the gallery, outside of the, the white cube. And for, for me, as, as a child, that was extremely crucial, right? I mean, we are coming from, from families, from communities that in many ways, um, the museum, the institution has been an off-front relationship, right? <laughs> that we, in many ways, have not been or felt in many ways um, welcome in these institutions. Uh, but also to think that, like, to be really clear that going to museums is also a privilege. <laughs> I mean, it, it allows, you have to have time. And a lot of a lot of people we live in and come from don't have time to engage in those types of leisures. Um, and, you know, I mean, I would say that it has been, and it, now that I'm, I feel like I'm on the other side is me trying to also replicate um, those, those same situations. I want people in many ways to feel comfortable in those spaces, right? That, in many ways to engage with the work, obviously that is coming from a very specific experience, right? Uh, that, that I don't want to, in many ways, replicate the same systems <laughs> that I'm trying to push against with. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's partly kind of what we're seeing with both the work that Sasad is doing, right? As well as kind of the work that you're doing. Um, yeah. And, you know, being kind of uh, one of the folks that was invited to participate um, in Desert X, right? Yeah. What that means, I think, not only for you all, right, and in really kind of, I think, stewarding artists of color, right, and in, in, again, moving into kind of these institutionalized spaces where we have not necessarily been welcome kind of in other moments, but I think also for, you know, for us in the community, right, to be able to support and um, to, to really kind of support and champion, right, artists from our community, right? Um, and as a, kind of a native of the Coachella Valley, I have to say, well, you know, there are, there are at least kind of two ways the, that I um, and a, am a kind of approaching it, right? Number one, I think, Cesar, the unbelievable work that you've done in kind of really bringing together, like, you know, with Neville, right, this group of folks, um, but also that, that, that idea of representation, right, of, of providing those artists kind of these platforms and of allowing us then to be able to engage kind of with those things, right? When I finally get the chance to stand in front of kind of Felipe's mural, right, there is kind of a connection kind of that I feel to that from who he is, right? And when I went to kind of Eduardo's kind of piece, right, there are a particular set of conversations that I'm able to have, like with family, right, that I'm able to have with other kind of community folks um, and with other folks that feel so unbelievably personal. Um, and so we're, you know, obviously kind of thrilled with both both of the work that, that you're doing. Um, I guess uh, 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 maybe just kind of two final kind of questions. So one, you know, this is going up, um, the opening, the, un the unveiling is uh, the weekend of April 9th. Right. Yes, yeah. this, the weekend of April 9th. Um, so, you know, for both of you, like now that, you know, it's, you know, you've spent all this time, all this stuff kind of has transpired and, Ah, you know, now it's April 9th that's coming up. So I wanted to give you just both kind of an opportunity to just, you know, have a final word on, um, you know, now that it's coming up, what this means, kind of how you're thinking through it, um, you know, and all of that. Cesar? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think that one of the, um, 
another thing that's important to think about our show is that we also, there were some like very practical logistical things that were also done um, for the kind of moment that we're living in, right? And that was being able to, I think when everyone sees an exhibition, we're so trained to be like, an exhibition is an opening moment. And it also allows for a kind of consumability that is almost expected. Like you come here and you take in this show, but also, you know, being able to spread out events over the duration of a show, that it isn't one thing that you get to consume. And also, quite frankly, that it is a thing that maybe you're not meant to see in in its entirety was important for me to almost play that role for certain writers and art critics who may complain about, well, there wasn't enough up. Maybe I didn't want it to be up and maybe this work wasn't for you. Um, there are certain intentionalities that Neville and I talked about in terms of how this exhibition would be laid out and which projects along with Felipe's there'll be a work by Christopher Myers. And also the thing that both works share is that those works will stay on, you know, in the community in beyond Desert X. So they're also operating in other kinds of temporalities. Um, and, and when you do that kind of work, you know, I wanted to be able to have a couple of programs that would help steward in Felipe's work prior to a much longer life that it's going to have beyond this iteration of Desert X and a series of other activations that we'll announce later that will animate these works. And so I think for me, the unveiling moment is a midpoint, but it isn't the end point. The work is going to have a different kind of life after it's up and it's going to be able to, my hope is be an opportunity to have other kinds of engagement um, with whoever's willing to engage, um, I think, right? Um, to be able to sort of have that work. And then, and then the same thing with Chris's. So the ends and beginning points, I think is something that got, uh, a little different um, that I sort of reimagined. And I think because it was sort of a moment where like we could try new things. I've always dreamed about the idea that you could curate across time and not just space and that you could deny somebody the opportunity to see a whole show as a consumable thing because museums train you to do that, right? You're like, these are the arts of like the Pacific and Oceania and here is the absolute truth. But if you can stretch out that beyond a particular moment, you also allow for it to get more complex and to be able to have other people interact in how these works exist. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we'll have this moment, but I also think that it's important to sort of engage with how it'll be stewarded in and the life that the work will have well beyond this edition of Desert X. Definitely. Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I'll say that I'm very much excited and thrilled about that stretch, right? That it gets to live beyond this exhibition date um, and what that would enable, we'll see. But I think I would say, uh, just to sort of end this, is that the mural for me speaks to another body that lives there, right? <laughs> and, and the title of the mural, Finding Home in My Own Flesh, is very much a reflection of, of about how humans who suffer learn to adapt and live under conditions where, where injustice is the common practice. And, and I think for me, you know, the way queer people and, and immigrants have learned to adapt and live under this, th these conditions is to imagine other worlds um, are possible and, and, and in a world where they can protect one another. Um, and that is the power of the queer immigrant imaginary that we've been speaking, right? That, that the present has not been enough for a lot of us and that we're constantly envisioning other worlds and in many ways just pushing forward. But, but also one of the ways we do this is by creating spaces and community. And this is why I keep going back to El Destino, you know, that was such a, that space was made for that reason. Um, and, you know, I think what I would just finish with is that I think much of the work that I'm doing, but also this mural is, is responding to a need and uh, very much is just a desire to create portals. And, and, and thus the, the essence of the project is, is to belong nowhere. <laughs> you know, it's to belong everywhere, to belong elsewhere. 
and, and that is that is queer immigrant making for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do have one final question for everyone who's watching. I love this idea about world making and the queer imaginary and the migrant imaginary, right? And this notion of kind of how important the imagination is. Um, and so I'm wondering, what what are you all reading or listening to? What's giving you life these days? Oh. What is helping you to kind of imagine or to build new worlds? Uh, you know, and it and are just kind of you know uh, making things making things fun for you right now. I want to go first because I told Felipe about one, and I don't want him to steal it. <laughs> um, <laughs> two things. Um, so many things were shut down last year, museums here in Southern California, everything, even though some commercial galleries open, I don't think, and even beyond just the past year, I don't think that I've seen a work of art that has moved me for, I, and I, I feel like one day I'm going to like write a very extended long journal article somewhere about it. There is a series called Veneno on HBO Max um, by Los Javis, who are Spanish filmmakers who are remarkable. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of biopic mini series, limited series about the life of Cristina La Veneno, an incredibly important trans woman in, from Spain um, and a really complicated life. But it's also a story that is so timely because it's also about the role that even though they didn't have social media back then, the role that media in general played in, in really shaping a life and, and, and the complexities that it created for her. Um, and, it, and it's remarkable, impeccable storytelling. Um, it, it, it's just beautiful. So watch it, Veneno on HBO Max. And then there's a, a philosopher who I've been reading, his work is just starting to get translated into English named Byung Shul Han. Um, who's writing a lot about rethinking our notion of the commons, um, the way that our screens, whether they be this or our phones or social media platforms are kind of creating a new kind of disembodiment. And they're all really short books, which I think for a scholar is interesting. And he does it intentionally, usually about less than a hundred pages. So it's a really interesting both form of creating new scholarship and really fascinating ideas. So those two things for me. All right, Felipe. Well, I me, mean, I would also say the Neno now, but no, yeah. I think you know, <laughs> no. But I think it's it's quite important. I mean, to mention that, you know, I think just the the power of that story itself, it, you know, the power of the collective right to envision another family outside of your your blood family, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a, as a mode of survival. But I mean, I wouldn't say that making the work is pushing me, but, you know, I think that's that happens at the end. And, and what's making the work possible is just being in conversation with with you both in many ways, you know, throughout the years, you know. Um, and what makes the work possible for me and what's pushing me forward is also uh, just sort of the uh, what I've been reading and going back to obviously going back to, you know, Jose Esteban Munoz, you know, and right now reading Gayashi Gopinath, you know, Unruly Visions and 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 thinking about you know them both in many ways enacting that that notion of like uh, of uh, choosing basically difference over sameness right and of enacting from that from those from those two things enacting different worlds of, of, of inhabiting time and space uh, and then you know I mean in the studio uh, you know uh, I would list obviously you know Nina Simone is back and forth you know like. And then Mercedes Sosa is on there too, Son Ra. Um, yeah, I think that that is what's pushing the work. You know, I think that's what helps the work happen in many ways. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, for anyone that's kind of um, interested in learning more about the laws and policies, particularly around immigration, I would recommend, and resistance as well, I would recommend Ruth Gomberg Munoz and Reina Wences have an article out that's looking at um, organizing um, in Chicago um, against uh, anti-deportation um, and anti kind of policing work. Um, Lacey Abrego and uh, Cecilia Menjivar, along with some other colleagues, also have a great piece that really kind of delves into um, the laws and policies that have criminalized migrant folks, um, and particularly that have gone after kind of Brown, brown folks, right? Um, but they kind of stretch us all the way back to the 1980s, the 1990s, right? Because these things are not just something that happened an administration ago, right? They've been with us for quite some time. 
Um, and Lisa, then what's getting you going? You didn't answer your own question. Well, you- the, what's getting right now is I have to say, I am loving um, Ocean Wong's book on Earth. We're briefly gorgeous. Yeah. And I'm even um, just kind of savoring it. Right. Uh, I read just a couple of pages and don't allow myself to kind of do any more than that. Uh, so that and then, of course, you know, I'm also one of the many that are big Bad Bunny fans. Um, so that's also um, making me just really, really happy these days. Oh. Um, and so with that, we'll kind of close it out. You know. Oh, and then, of course, Desert X, right? Yes. I'm going and checking out kind of some of these um, fantastic um, pieces, right? Um, so I encourage everyone to check them out. And to follow the public program, this is the first sort of event of many that are remarkable sort of head of um, education and mediation projects um, Mary Gladstone is working on. There'll be a series, there'll be a program as well next week, um, a related program. Please check the website, www.desertx.org to make sure that you can sort of see the schedule of upcoming programs and events. And hopefully you get to, to see the exhibition if you live in the Coachella Valley many times. Um, and if you can make it out to see it, you know, I hope you can. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you both. Thank you.